Right. Welcome everyone to the 23rd annual conference of the Association for Heterodox Economics. We are very pleased to start this conference with this very great plenary on COVID-19, gender inequalities and heterodox economics. My name is Ariana Aronsoyi and I will be the chair of the session and I will be supported by Danielle Gizio, who will provide technical support. Before I introduce uh, the panelists and some background information for the panelists, I would like to just mention that we are recording this session. So here this recording will relate to the audio and video of the keynote speakers. And we will hear the presentations of the keynote speakers first, before then opening up the floor for a general Q&A. So you should have in your Zoom function uh, chat button where you can ask technical questions to Danielle in case you're experiencing any difficulties. And you should have a Q&A chat function where you can ask questions. Here you can ask your personal questions or you can vote also for questions which you want to have answered. So in case someone already uh, posts the question you want to ask. And for those who are tweeters, you can tweet us under Hashtag HE2021. And as I mentioned before, if you have technical issues, please feel free to put your uh, questions in the chat for Danielle to answer. We will have three keynote speakers today and we're very thrilled to have them join us today. And the first keynote speaker is Elissa Brownstein, who will speak on stratification and social reproduction in a post-pandemic world, a feminist macro perspective. Elisa is a professor and chair of economics at Colorado State University and editor of the journal Feminist Economics. She also has done consulting work for a number of international development institutions, including the International Labour Organization, World Bank, United Nations Research Institute on Social Development and UN Women. Her work focuses on the international and macroeconomic aspects of development with emphasis on economic growth, macro policy, social reproduction, and gender. The second speaker will be then Lynn Awesome. Lynn Awesome will speak on rethinking economics, uh, economies of care in the wake of the COVID-19 in Africa. Lynn is a se senior research specialist at the Institute for Economic Justice in Johannesburg and serves on several boards, including the International Association for Feminist Economics and the Council for the Development of social science research in Africa. She's also an editorial board member of Agarian South, Journal of Political Economy, co-editor of the Journal of Contemporary African Studies and advisory board member of Feminist Africa. Her research focuses on feminist political economy and political theory with particular interest in gender, labor, land and agrarian studies, the modern state and the political economy of gendered violence. Lynn is also the, co the author of Gender, Ethnicity and Violence in Kenya's Transitions to Democracy and the co-editor of the volume Labor Questions in the Global South. Our third keynote speaker is then Sue Himmelweich, whose presentation is entitled Gender Equality Requires a Caring Economy, First Step a Care-Led Economy. Sue is an emeritus professor of economics at the Open University and a member of the management committee for the Women's Budget Group, member of the editorial board of Feminist Economics, economics and the Journal of Women, Politics and Policy. Her research focuses on intra-household inequalities, the economics and policy of caring and gender implication of economic and social policy. And she has recently co-edited a book on economics in Australia in Europe, Gendered Impacts and Sustainable Alternatives. As I mentioned before, we are very thrilled to have all three keynote speakers giving the opening plenary today. So we will now listen to the three presentations, each presentation about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will open up for general Q&A. So I would like to hand over now to Elisa for the first presentation. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to now share my screen. Okay, how does that look? Good. 
Okay, let me get situated here. Thank you very much for inviting me today. It looks like an excellent conference. Uh, I put together this talk after I wrote the title, which helped me a lot, but it's really about eliciting conversation. Uh, and I, I wish we were in person. It's a little more difficult to give this talk to a sort of disembodied audience, but here we go. Uh, stratification and social reproduction in a post-pandemic world. Uh, so first I wanted to start out by noting some priors. Uh, so I think in general, economics, including heterodox economics, needs more feminist theory and feminist economists. I think that macroeconomics though is particularly bad. And, and this is despite the fact that macroeconomic structures like the distribution of production across economic sectors, the extent of global integration, um, monopoly, corporate power, so mac these macro structures and then macro policies, policies like trade openness, capital account openness, public spending, wage floors, tax policies, and also macro constraints like debt, balance of payments, public health needs, uh, employment gaps. All of these features, these structures, policies, and constraints are at the very core of some of the most pressing economic questions of the day, inequality, poverty, development, climate change, social welfare provisioning. And come up with an important question, an important social question or challenge, uh, and macro conditions or circumstances can make or break it, I think. And I think that these challenges call for a feminist macro, but for that we need more feminist macroeconomists, uh, especially from the global now, no, from the global south, but also from the global north. Now there's been a lot of great feminist work on the gender differential impacts of macro crises and structures. I think the most recent special issue on feminist uh, economic perspectives on COVID-19 uh, published by the journal I edit Feminist Economics is a good example of that. And more recently, I think feminist work on care has strengthened its macroeconomic aspects. Uh, poised to take advantage of some of the intellectual and policy spaces that have been opened up by the recent demonstration that a care crisis can actually cause a macroeconomic crisis. And I think both Lynn and Sue's work are great examples of, of this. So I look forward to their talks. But I think macro theory, both of the orthodox and heterodox variety is what I would term a hyper-masculine field uh, within an already masculine one, economics in general. Uh, very few women, much less feminist economists, go into macro. There's lots, <clears throat> excuse me, there's lots of reference to macroeconomic issues, uh, but to the extent that gender gets incorporated into macro modeling, uh, it's still a hyper-masculine sort of approach. And, and this kind of modeling dictates how questions are framed, how we go about answering them, <clears throat> our very understanding of how economies work, what determines inflation, the price of labor, the exchange rate, or the unemployment rate. And to the extent I think that gender has been incorporated it gets incorporated in very sort of orthodox terms. For instance, where dependent care is hypothesized merely as a constraint on women's labor force participation. <clears throat> and this is a question I've been thinking about uh, for a while, particularly in terms of heterodox macro. And uh, when I think about these things, I always come back to this uh, Heidi Hartman quote uh, from her uh, 
article, The Unhappy Marriage of Marxism and Feminism, and I'll read it for you. The quote, marriage of Marxism and feminism has been like the marriage of husband and wife depicted in English common law. Marxism and feminism are one, and that one is Marxism. And of course, what Heidi was talking about is that the feminist struggle is so often subsumed to the struggle against capital, rather than thinking about patriarchy and reproduction as systems that are parallel to capitalism. At times, they may be complementary to capitalism, for instance, gender norms that elicit the provisioning of free care by women. At other times, they may be anathema to it. Uh, such as gender norms that constrain women's labor force participation or produce gender inequities in health and education, inequities that are economically costly. I think most significantly, uh, economic orthodoxy, meaning maybe the mainstream, does a slightly better job of treating labor as a produced means of production through its concept of human capital, I think, than the mainstream of what I would call heterodox macro. So when you think about labor as a produced means of production, it's one that requires right additional investments in childhood, old age, and during periods of disability. Sorry, just one question. Yes. Are you having several slides? Because I can just see the starting slide and I just wanted to make sure oh, in case I you did. have several, yeah. that it goes further. Thank you. I wonder. Maybe just. I'll, stop I'll start. It, and, I'll try to share again. Yeah. Um, hold on. Thank you for interrupting yes. me. I think. Okay, now I'm going to let's start the slideshow. Okay, and I will share again. Okay, can you see the front slide now? That's the front slide, yeah. Okay, and then yeah, now it moves. Perfect. Okay, now it's Perfect. going. I wonder what happened. Okay, thank you so much. No <laughs> so feminist macro, uh, to give you a little overview of what feminist macro looks like. So feminist macroeconomists make connections between the macro economy and gender equality and well-being. And these connections go in both directions. Uh, one sort of category looks at the differential impact of macro structure and policy on gender equality and gendered well being. Some of the earliest efforts looked at the impact of increasing labor intensive export orientation on the relative demand for uh, women in the labor market, women's labor. Uh, other examples are the gender distribution of the costs of austerity. Another category of work looks at how gender relations themselves affect the structure and performance of the economy. Perhaps the most well known is that which engages with how gender inequality in health, education, and labor force participation, for instance, affects economic growth. But other efforts uh, have looked at things like gender biased access to agricultural inputs, credit, and land, and how those affect aggregate productivity. Uh, as reflected on this panel today, a new sort of cutting edge, I think, in this field accounts for how care and social reproduction in particular impacts the macro economy and how the macro economy impacts that sort of social provisioning. So I want to pause, I was, the, today's talk is about stratification and social reproduction. So I, I want to talk a little bit about specific examples that illustrate how gender stratification impacts the structure and performance of the macro economy. And so here by stratification, I mean systems of structural and intentional distribution 
that are held up by institutions and norms and stereotypes, for instance, about whose job it is to take care of other people. And these create social and economic hierarchies in which some groups are identified as more deserving of economic prizes like jobs than others. An example of the kind of work that uses stratification as a perspective in feminist macro is on the political economy of central bank policy. Uh, and some of this work, uh, I've contributed to it, James Heinz, Stephanie Seguino, looks at how subordinate groups shoulder a disproportionate share of the social costs of finance-friendly monetary policy. The work that I did with James Heinz uh, found that it, among developing and emerging economies, the kinds of, when, when central banks introduce monetary policies to keep inflation low, the results are overwhelmingly contractionary and women's employment suffers more than men's. Uh, James Heinz and Stephanie Sabuino looked at these impacts in developed economies and in particular found that ethnic and racial minorities in the US, those who are less educated and less skilled, saw greater employment losses with higher interest rates. So from a political economy perspective then, wage compression enables sacrifice ratios, right? Meaning the relationship, the, the, the amount of em employment you have to sacrifice uh, relative to interest rates and inflation to be higher for some politically less powerful groups than others, which makes finance-friendly monetary policy a little less politically costly. Some other work that I did with Stephanie Seguino looks at how gender segregation uh, in the labor market results in lower bargaining power for labor overall and has an impact on the labor share of income. So in some empirical work that we did, we found that among developing countries, after controlling for other factors, increased gender segregation in the labor market was associated with a 4.7% decline in the labor share. This is pretty significant. Turning now to the social reproduction side, uh, which I, I do uh, some macro modeling work on social reproduction. And by social reproduction, I'm talking about the time and commodities in my, in my work it takes to maintain invest in and reproduce, reproduce the labor force. And as I said in the introduction, economic growth models don't tend to treat uh, labor as produced or maintained. Uh, maybe there's more so in the long run in terms of modeling population growth or how investments in standard measures of human capital impact growth. But there's almost nothing in the short run in terms of the daily needs that we have to restore ourselves. Uh, this is a woodcut from, uh, that I borrowed from the cover of Nancy Fulbright's book, Who Pays for the Kids. And here you have a factory in the background where the workers go into work, but then at the end of the day, they come home and they're on a different assembly line where they get restored to show up, the work, to, show up to work the next day. So I want to give you a taste of what a heterodox macro uh, model looks like that incorporates these features of social reproduction. And so I'm just going to give you a picture of the demand side uh, of this kind of approach. And here on the demand side, labor markets are segregated by gender and the relationship between gender equality and economic growth depends on the impacts of gender equality measured as um, a smaller gender wage gap, the impacts on production and profitability. So we can differentiate between two sort of stylized types of economies, one that I characterize as care-led and the other one is inequality-led. In the care-led economy, the relationship between gender equality in the labor market and growth is positive. In the inequality-led economy, it's negative. 
<clears throat> and the key feature that helps us differentiate between these two stylized types of economies is the extent of caring spirits, which refers to the tendency, whether it's determined by social norms or individual motivations or public preferences as reflected in the structure of the social welfare state to provide care or support for care for oneself and others in ways that add to current production and future productivity. We also go into uh, different types of macro policy stances and how these contribute, but I'm just giving you a taste of what this looks like today. So I'm gonna skip over this. Now we also specify a supply side, which is uh, based on the distribution of social reproduction across women, men, the state and capital. And here differentiate between two stylized types, a low road where responsibilities, both in terms of time and financial costs are concentrated among women um, and a high road, which is more <clears throat> gender egalitarian. And then we get this two by two table, uh, combining a care led demand side with a low road supply side results in what we term a time squeeze where higher wages for women are good for growth on the demand side, but more market participation squeezes time and lowers uh, social reproduction or human capacities production. So because of this contradiction between the demand and supply sides, growth is elusive or unstable. A parallel contradiction happens when demand is inequality led and uh, supply is high road. And we call that a wage squeeze. <clears throat> the two complementary conditions of uh, mutual and exploitation uh, are one where uh, growth and social reproduction reinforce one another on the mutual side, but on the exploitation side, growth is partly based on exploiting women's labor and human resources. Uh, we also do, uh, I've done an empirical estimation of these different social reproduction regimes. And on the whole, we find over time, the world on average is getting more gender egalitarian on the supply side in terms of the distribution of social reproduction, but it's getting more inequality led <clears throat> on the demand side. So in closing and thinking about where we go from here, this is the post pandemic part of the talk. <clears throat> the post-pandemic world part of the talk. So our circumstances, I think, haven't been transformed by the pandemic so much as laid bare, right, the stresses and stratification that pre-existed it. But there are opportunities to, or new opportunities to transform the debate and how we think about economics. I think an example of that is the mainstreaming of discussions of social infrastructure in the U.S., is an example of one heartening opportunity along those lines. I think that um, Lynn and Sue will talk about others. Another example is the long overdue racial reckoning that has swept through parts of the US and across a number of other countries. Uh, just a couple of days ago, for instance, the, Hu the UN human rights chief published a report calling for reparations for people of African descent. Uh, and I think that that is a, an important signifier of shifts in the global conversation. In the US also the mainstreaming of the notion of, ba of baby bonds, uh, especially by Derek Hamilton and others as a way to counter racial wealth inequality is another example. So these are all really wonderful things, but we still need a macro that is built upon an understanding of stratification and social reproduction in order to devise solutions. And I think injecting more feminism into macro would be an excellent way to do it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the very interesting and great presentation. Thank you so much. As a next presentation, we will hear from Lynn, who will talk about rethinking economic, economies of care in the wake of COVID-19 in Africa. Okay. Thank you, Ariane, and, uh, and thanks, Elisa. I enjoyed listening to you. Uh, can you hear me okay? 
Okay. So um, I'm going to base my uh, reflections more in the context of of Africa, but also in the global south more broadly, you know, what I like to uh, think of as the agrarian south in line with an area of work that that has informed a lot of my own theorizations on social reproduction. Uh, and, and begin by tracing um, some of the, you know, some broad conceptual outlines uh, in the thinking around uh, social reproduction. Uh, so one of the major tendencies in the thinking around uh, on social reproduction and care uh, economies more broadly has, to, has been to understand it in relation to uh, exploitation by capital, right? So within the wage labor capital relation and, and, and within um, circuits of capital. Um, but this framing um, tends to miss or exclude workers uh, for whom the work of social reproduction, whether waged or, or non-waged uh, uh, work, uh, the, uh, you know, workers for whom this work constitutes a significant portion of the work they perform. And Rao and others in a recent working paper have, have shown this in a very, uh, you know, work based on time use studies in India. Uh, and, and in my own work uh, with, with Suresh and I do, we have tried to think of social reproduction uh, shifting away or, uh, you know, not to think of it exclusively within this wave of capital relation, but uh, in, because one, we think that locating uh, uh, the problem in the relation of exploitation uh, tends to lend itself in a kind of derivative uh, fashion to value creation for capitalist accumulation and the industrialization myth, which we have not seen, uh, you know, that, that myth of that, that countries are industrializing is not born by the realities on the continent, in the global south more broadly. Um, and, 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 you know, so rather thinking about it uh, uh, in, the, in relation to the requirements of sustenance and survival of households, which uh, is necessitated by the extreme and ongoing immiseration of workers that we are seeing right now. So this is a move in a sense beyond the reproduction of, of various classes that sustain monopoly capitalism. So to think of, 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 of social reproduction beyond that frame. Uh, you know, the focus is not on remuneration for gendered labor, and I'm not dismissing this, but rather are concerned with what it is that makes the continued reproduction of working class households possible, right? Against the onslaught of, of you know, imperialism, of ongoing capitalist accumulation. So that is one. Second, um, you know, we know and, you know, we are increasingly acknowledge that, you know, reproductive labor is rarely actually about competition and exchange value, uh, despite its constant articulation with capitalist production. Uh, reproduct, uh, the reproduction of the laboring classes and its primary concern with ensuring the survival of the family and household has in fact been subordinate to capitalist production. Uh, so rather than a concern with the creation of value, its primary uh, preoccupation is with the sustenance of life. And third and related to, the, to these two uh, is, uh, you know, when we locate these processes in agrarian societies, we see that the peasant unit, which is the primary productive, reproductive unit in agrarian societies. The peasant unit actually produces goods and services for its reproduction, rather than merely converting them to use values, right? Uh, uh, or purchasing them with wages. Uh, this means that in those societies, in these agrarian societies, 
gendered labor may be actually indistinguishable one from agrarian uh, labor, right? And importantly, gendered labor, uh, for gendered labor, for this, gen this, this kind of gendered labor, land and landed resources become the primary site of contestation and competition and not primarily the market, you know. So in, in, in the way that we would think of social reproduction um, through the wage labor capital relation in agrarian societies, uh, you know, gendered labor and its uh, kind of uh, articulation or, or you know, fungibility uh, uh, in relation to, to, to uh, uh, agrarian labor the land itself becomes a, a site of contestation and not primarily the market as uh, the case, as is the case for those involved in petty trade or in wage labor. Uh, we might in, in relation to these uh, conceptual and analytical perspectives also then uh, begin to think of ways in which gendered labor of which, of course, care is, is core, uh, and its dependence on land uh, constitute co uh, contemporary agrarian questions. So in our own work, we've been thinking of, you know, moving away from the classical agrarian uh, uh, question and, uh, uh, you know, and, and to think of gender in inequity, gender inequality itself as constituting uh, a a contemporary agrarian question. Uh, and we've been able to at least begin uh, theorization around this through uh, locating uh, the question of care, the question of social reproduction, historically and structurally in, in the global south, right? This is not, however, the focus uh, of, my, of my talk today. Lastly, we might consider uh, uh, not last year, as in, my, but in, in, on these conceptual questions, we might consider these regimes of gendered labor or economies of care in relation to households whose connection to the world of capital accumulation uh, is tenuous at best and whose internal logic and choice of livelihood activities may be driven by the imperatives of sheer survival. You know, in other words, we are saying the reproduction of labor power in context where the labor where that labor power is not guaranteed to ever enter into circuits of capital. How do we think of this? So, in a sense, we are thinking of social reproduction in relation to the surplus population, right? And this is a, a very real question, which you've seen in 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 you know, COVID has just intensified this, it has intensified the massive immiseration of the working classes. Um, the expulsion of labor and mass has been going on for a really long time. But uh, now, I think in the wake of this pandemic, we are sitting with an even uh, uh, larger mass. So I want to turn briefly on this relationship between social reproduction and, and, and the surplus population. Uh, you know, and begin by saying that, you know, late capitalism's tendency towards massive depersonalization, um, you know, in, in, if we think of it in the classical agrarian terms, in classical agrarian terms, uh, uh, the, the tendency towards uh, massive depersonalization of the countryside and the casualization of, uh, of semi-proletarianized labor, right? Because, uh, we, we are seeing that in um, uh, you know, the, the sort of classical wage laborer who, who subsists entirely on wages doesn't really exist um, in, in agrarian societies. Uh, and, and this has had an, an acute impact on agrarian households, you know, raising anew the significance of the social uh, reproduction of, of the surplus population and the relationship between these two. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of gap, the ensuing gap between actual consumption and consumption 
afforded by wage income has to be filled, uh, it, this, this gap has to be uh, fulfilled either through state intervention or additional uh, household production. Uh, but the persistence of, of you know, e economic insecurity in the absence of adequate wages and state intervention uh, forces working class households to engage in subsistence production and care work. So we already know that the existence and persistence of such household reproduction particularly allows capitalists to expect the reproduction of, of labor in the absence of a living wage and inadequate social welfare programs. And this of course um, has the effect of expanding the scope of production of the production of simple use values within the domestic sphere. Uh, consequently, non-capitalist social formations of household and family labor uh, shoulder a large portion of the burden of meeting minimum consumption levels essential for daily and generational reproduction. Uh, and this means that uh, the, the, uh, the means of subsistence in, is, in this case is not merely acquired uh, uh, through expenditure on wages, but also through means that are outside uh, of the capitalist mode of production. This link between um, the relative surplus population, whether you're thinking of the latent or the floating or the stagnant population, uh, the, this link between this relative surplus population and capital accumulation has already been well understood in the literature, where, whether we are thinking of it in relation to economic crisis, whether we are thinking of it in terms of open versus closed economies, whether we are thinking of it through the fragmentation of the employment structure and, and informal uh, employment, or, and this is particularly, has been you know, uh, very pronounced in the, in the global south, whether we are thinking of it in relation to the rise in dispossessed rural uh, populations due to grabs of private and common lands, right? Uh, and, and debt and non-viability of agrarian households. So when you can think of the farmer suicides that we have seen in many parts of Asia. So this uh, surplus population, you know, uh, which, is often viewed as a potential reserve army of labor is an important condition, again, we know this, for capital accumulation because it depresses wages and keeps existing workers in check. It also offers a release for workers in recessionary times and is a pool of potential workers to draw from in terms of economic boom. But acknowledging um, the need for a surplus population does not address how that population will be kept alive in order to be useful to capital when needed. And especially so when this population is not necessary, is not no longer useful to capital, right? In most contemporary societies, the state capital nexus, even when it has taken on a significant role in provisioning has fallen short of assuming the full cost of reproduction. Um, the capitalist demand for abstract and not concrete labor is also such that as long as the class of laborers perpetuates itself, it does not matter uh, which individual laborer is unable to show up for work a fact which allows capitalists to super exploit or hyper exploit their workers without regard to their health or, or, or well-being. So therefore beyond a particular uh, threshold, many of these lives are expendable and the labors of mostly women who keep uh, the laboring populations al alive are outside uh, the interest domain of of general society and of policy makers. Um, working people may instead rely on other forms of production in order to satisfy reproductive needs. Uh, uh, some of these may be purely 
to satisfy consumption needs uh, of the laboring classes while others, including petty, petty commodity production, um, may be linked to capitalist relations of production through exchange. Uh, so the insufficiency of only one form of, of reproduction actually suggests extreme strain. The fact that most poor, most working class households have to rely on this combination of incomes, you know, wages, subsistence, farming, petty commodity production is, is, is actually a sign of extreme uh, strain, right? Um, uh, and this articulation of, you know, petty commodity production to wage labor uh, and peasant production is rendered most visible through gendered relations in agrarian societies. Um, and, and this uh, warrant, you know, partly, and this is, um, again, I can't go into this because of time, but we have argued that, you know, when we, uh, where that these three now, uh, the, the sort of, sorry, okay. The sort of labor that, um, you know, the, this articulation between wage labor, uh, 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 petty commodity production and subsistence, they, they are linked um, through uh, the gendered labor processes um, that sustain them, that you know, are, are very much around social reproduction, but are also, as I said earlier, cannot be distinguished from the agrarian uh, labor in those in those societies. So all of these issues have played out uh, in in renewed ways amidst the scramble for care and survival during the COVID pandemic. So that the the third and last uh, section of Mama, what I want to speak about is on the COVID context. Uh, uh, could you, how long do I have? You have four more minutes. Okay, I'll try to take five maybe. <laughs> the, the COVID um, uh, pandemic, you know, has exposed the, uh, the economies of unpaid and unrecognized uh, care and reproductive labor that sustains uh, the workforce and millions of, of families and households amidst austerity and material dispossession. But importantly, this, uh, the pandemic also raises new questions. And I think Elisa was talking a bit about this, new questions about labor market integration and the nature of care labor in the context of, of you know, labor market restructuring. So in this regard, it necessitates extending the analysis of the care economy beyond the question of social provisioning to include a deeper reflection on the structural dynamics of care work. And you know, we can think of three particular trends, uh, trends that we have seen uh, in, on, you know, on the continent. First is the insufficiency of state provisioning an increased burden of, of social reproduction uh, you know, facing mainly women, although not exclusively. Uh, this crisis has exposed both the inadequacy of pre-existing welfareist uh, regimes, you know, whether we're thinking of social grants or cash transfers that were, that, that uh, pre, uh, uh, preceded the, the uh, COVID, but also the gross insufficiency of of public systems of, of social provisioning, uh, which are unable to cushion uh, households um, in the midst of the crisis. Uh, second is the restructuring of the labor market. In a sense, you know, it's very interesting because in a sense, it points to the, 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 the importance of wages, you know, I, I might say the endurance, the enduring significance of wages. You know, in South Africa, for example, women generally lost jobs at a higher rate than men, although they also recovered them at a higher rate, right? Um, uh, and uh, although uh, employed women were also working fewer hours per week. But what this data highlights is 
the expendable nature of, of course, of sectors with a higher proportion of female workers. At the same time, the swifter reincorporation of women into the labor force in the post uh, lockdown phase indicates a skewed and probably temporary recovery that we are seeing. Um, and this is confirmed, and this is specifically in the South African, the data that we are seeing in South Africa. And this is confirmed by the fact that only half of those that found employment in the post lockdown period were employed before the hard lockdown with the other half being new entrants into the labor market, right? So together, this, uh, together these st st statistics may actually be, you know, they might be indicating that the types of job, uh, jobs on offer have likely shifted, suggesting a growth in lower skilled, worse paid feminized jobs. Um, they might also be suggesting the reconstitution of traditionally gendered uh, and unrecognized work as paying jobs. Um, they may also uh, be indicating a greater incorporation, the, 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 the greater uh, incorporation of waged care work into capitalist circuits. So again, uh, slightly going against the point I was making earlier. So we're just beginning to make sense of this data. Third is we, have, we are seeing an altering of livelihood strategies. The combined fall in wage income uh, and the importance of the market for social provisioning. Uh, the state's uh, inadequate provisioning for poor households means that women have been driven towards a cornucopia of livelihood strategies, which include, and this is often in combination, like again, I, I mentioned this, wage labor, petty, petty commodity production, and subsistence agriculture. The implication is that in addition to loss of jobs, the restructuring of labor has also to be understood in relation to the other income sources that subsidize households in the absence of wages or alongside wages, including the uh, you know, state provisioning. But also importantly for us thinking from the global south, access to resources such as land that support subsistence uh, consumption in much of the third world. Um, I'll just finish, I know I'm, I'm out of time. So, um, you know, just, you know, in relation to these massive changes in the social and economic structure of markets and of households, uh, of household demand and consumption, we need to ask whether what we are seeing is a fundamental shift uh, in the structure of production and social reproduction with long-term implications uh, for understanding social relationships and social policy. Uh, or, you know, in other words, we need to ask whether this moment uh, uh, represents a structural break that poses um, significant danger but also offers concrete possibilities for social change or whether we, are see, we, we will uh, return to the pre-COVID status quo. Um, you know, importantly, um, so we, and, and, and also in, in this context, we need to be concerned with the social impacts of the existing and emerging um, regimes of care uh, you know, the relationship between the care economy and the state, you know, do the interventionist, because we saw a lot of interventionist measures, uh, which are, are, have been quite uncharacteristic of developing country governments over the last three decades. Do the interventionist uh, measures that we have seen during this period signal a redefinition of the old relationships? Lastly, lastly and importantly, we have to take account of the agrarian structure of social reproduction in the global south. Um, uh, means, uh, you know, this means expanding the scope of the discussion of care and social reproduction to include demand, demand both for rural and urban land and the related uh, struggles around these, these resources 
incorporating into our analysis questions of food sovereignty and its precondition of national sovereignty and paying attention to the ways in which ongoing processes of land dispossession um, or primitive accumulation reconstitute the relationship between producers and reproducers, between town and country and social reproduction itself as the subject of politics and not just economics. And this is a slight challenge to Elisa around uh, um, what you are talking about. Of course, care is uh, a question of economic policy. But, you know, even though, uh, you know, when we think of poverty, poverty, uh, even though poverty primarily poses, a, a, you know, a question of economic exclusion, the ways in which the state, the neoliberal state, thinks of the economically in, uh, excluded is fundamentally as individual uh, subjects, not as political groups, right? Uh, so there is um, a need to think of, 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 of you know, this social reproduction it, itself and those who constitute the groups that undertake this labor also as as political groups. I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the very great uh, presentation and very interesting, yeah, questions you raised in the end. Uh, it's, uh, it's definitely very interesting to think about. And as the last presentation, we have now Sue, and Sue is going to talk about gender equality requires a care and economy. First step, a care led economy. And as I promise I will let you know when you have 10 minutes left and five minutes left. Okay, great. You still on mute. Can you also let me know if it's going to work with my screen? Yes. I'll, so I'll you can try to yeah. share. Yeah. Try, try that now. Uh, and then... Yes, I can see it. Yes, but I need to check that they move. Okay. Because what happened to Elisa happened to somebody else when I was um recently so it can happen so it, do, has it changed yes it has changed okay all right Great. i'll go, go back to the i will let you know if something doesn't work in between yeah it works i can see right it. but i'm going the wrong direction now <laughs> um here we are good okay. Great. okay thank you very much well thank you for inviting me and thank you to the pre two previous speakers for excellent talks I'm really sorry, Lynn, that I might say some things that I have not are not really taking into account what you've just said, because I just don't think that quickly that I can manage that. I think my talk, because I have heard a list before, I may, it may be more, more capable of taking account of some of the things that she said, but I really enjoyed both of them very much. What I'm going to try and aiming to do in this talk is something quite different, which is first of all, it's to concentrate on the UK, since I'm from here, and a lot of the audience, of course, is. Um, but I want, and I want to tell a story about how an academic understanding of social reproduction can inform policy. Um, and this is partly to do with my own history. Um, I'm an academic economist, I'm a feminist economist. I've worked on areas centered on the boundaries of what's thought about as the economy and the household, and in particular on the theory of care and how it differs from the goods whose production and distribution ec economists typically think about and the implications that has for economic theory and policy. And, um, but I've done this both as an academic in my, at the Open University, but also um, through a think tank, the Women's Budget Group, that actually I was the first chair of, has been going now for well, it's actually been going for 30 years, but I got involved 20 years ago, but we, we then changed it into a different sort of structure. Um, and it's a think tank that aims to promote a gender equal economy. And what we do is we analyze and comment on the gender impact of economic and social policy. Um, you can see it from our name that it's particularly on budgets, but not exclusively on those. And our members are academics, activists, 
policy experts from women's organizations, universities and trade unions, a, a big mix of people. Um, and when it first started, it was just a voluntary organization. It's now a professional think tank, in fact, quite well funded and we have a number of paid staff. And what we do is basically is connect academic work to policy engagement. Um, and in doing that up to now, most of our reports and responses have been reactive. We've, we've said things about actual policy or policy changes proposed by others. Um, but in 2019, we got some funding to set up a commission on a gender equal economy. And that was a chance to do something po positive, proactive, instead of just thinking about reacting to other people's policies, it was thinking about what policies did we really want to promote a gender equal economy. Um, and we did it, this was UK wide, so we took a four nations approach, which, um, as you know, we, we have slightly different laws in different parts of the country and different um, social conditions too. So that was important. And we took an intersectional approach. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but we were very keen not to see just women as a homogenous group, but to see about intersections with other um, inequalities. So when we started, we said we got these um, worthy people, commissioners. Actually, you can see that I was very honoured to be one. But most of the most of the commissioners are not. We're not actually from the women's budget group. They were people who did know something about our issues, but they were not um, our homegrown people. Um, and we expected the commissioners, they just want to focus on policy. But we found, much to our surprise, that they started by saying, no, we've got to discuss and understand the underlying causes. causes. And instead of our first sessions focusing on social investment or whatever, we actually spent our time looking at sexual reproduction. Um, and not very surprisingly in terms of content, but rather surprising to me in terms of the context, they decided that gender inequalities in the economy depended on gender divisions in social reproduction. Um, I don't think, we didn't actually use that term social reproduction in the commission. And what I mean by it is the way the whole system reproduces itself, a term that comes from Marxism with a a folk where it's a focus on the production of things, but the important idea that comes from Marx is the idea that it is the reproduction of the relations of production. It's not just how those things themselves are produced, but how people are, are reproduced in the same relationship to each other in Marx's case over reproduction. What feminist economics did was say, yeah, that's a good idea, but you've also got to focus on how people are produced and the reproduction of the gender relations of human reproduction. And that's one of the things that Alyssa, for example, has done a lot of work on. So what do I mean by human reproduction? Well, everything people need to grow up and keep going as members of society. You could think of them as workers, but they some of these people won't be typically what you think of as workers, but they're all con contributing to, the, to that reproduction process in some way or another. Um, and very importantly, the point that feminist economics makes is that it includes care as well as food, if you like. It's that people don't keep going. We can't have a system in which people are reproduced if we, are, if we haven't got some people caring for other people. It's a perfectly normal part of the system of reproduction. And the second point is that much of this goes on outside what is recognized as the economy, what we might call the paid economy. Um, and that this is where gender inequality starts. This is what the commission decided, that that's the point where gender inequality starts. So we ended up with a diagram like this. Um, it, I don't know how well you can see it, but in the middle, we have that women do 60% more unpaid care and domestic work than men. And following through all the implications around that, women have less time for paid work, less able to travel for work, earn less per hour, more likely to be poor in old age, et cetera, all the way around. Um, I will give you, if you want to look at this in more detail later, I'll give you a link to where you can find it. 
sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, So the, what the commission decided was that the underlying structural cause of gender inequalities was the under, unequal gender division of unpaid care. But I think there's some limitations in this diagram that was drawn. So this diagram as a spiral leaves out the links that feed back from all these other things that are produced back to the um, the fact that we have an unequal division of unpaid care responsibilities. So it says at the end, how do we break the cycle? But actually, as it's drawn, it's not a cycle. It's a spiral with one cause. And actually, the reason that gender inequality is so persistent is because it's not a spiral, but it is a cycle. And the, the, the outcomes of gender inequality of, of unpaid work go back to reinforce those gender inequalities in unpaid work. And that's that to have those links would be necessary in, in order to show how the system of gender inequality reproduces itself. Um, and these feedback effects are both sort of material and ideological. So the unequal division of unpaid care reinforces views of women, say, as naturally suited to care, but also low paid, low pay and care work results in making its women's paid work, which in turn reinforces the idea that when they go home, it's their unpaid work too. Um, so that notion of, of social reproduction and the, the, the whole system that reproduces itself is a very important idea. And what feminists were saying was, yes, we like that idea. It's a really useful one for looking at why systems have some stability to them, but you've left out an awful lot of it. And we've, we have, we've added, it to it. Um, I said I wanted to set up an in intersectional approach and um, in the commission when we decided to take an intersectional approach I felt it was very important that we see it as looking at the way that different structures of oppression intersect and that was for us a somewhat new thing to do because in the women's budget group we'd always been very clear, clear, careful to differentiate different groups so for example if we looked at poverty rates, we wouldn't just look at poverty rates of households with women in them, we'd look at household, um, households with black women in them and, and uh, different or households with disabled women in them. But I think what we became clearer through the commission is that that's not quite good enough for, look, for really being intersectional. What you have to look at is the different ways, the structures that determine uh, the um, racial oppression or the structures that determine the oppression of disabled um, people with disabilities um, intersect. Sue, so you yep. have 10 minutes left. Okay, I will go fast. Um, <laughs> so to translate this in, into policy, we asked, we asked, how do we break the cycle? Um, and because it is a cycle, what we need to do is to work at all the links simultaneously. We need particular policies to break the links in many at many different places. We need that, but we also need a whole approach to new approach to policy thinking. And that's what we meant by a caring economy now. And it, it meant putting care on the economic agenda. So we have department, you know, there's departments of government that deals with care, um, but it's not, it's not the treasury. It's not, the, it's, it's not seen as an economic issue. And what we wanted to make was the point that what happens to care is an economic issue. And all policy, especially economic policy, needs evaluating through the lens of care. And in particular, care policy itself is economic policy. So if you like, our theme was that if we're talking about a caring economy, it's got to have, be one that promotes gender equality, but it's also got to be sustainable. And it also has to fit within a general uh, view of a well-being economy. And I'm just gonna say a bit more about that in a minute. So we came up, I said we needed lots of specific policies too. We also came up with eight steps to a caring economy. Um, they're on here and I'm going to whiz through them very quickly so you can see some of them, but I'm not going to talk about, only going to talk about one of them. So that if you, any, if you want to come back um, on any of them in the questions, you can. Um, and I'll also again give you links where you can see them in more detail. 
So the first thing, and what I think is the most important is that we have to re-envision what we meant by the economy. So use an aggregate well-being indicator rather than GDP for measuring what we thought of as economic pro progress. And to do that, we needed to redefine what you mean by production, efficiency, productivity, and you have to do it in terms of their social environmental value and well-being rather than in market value. Um, in doing that involved recognizing the, the contribution of unpaid work by redefining what you mean by cost include, to include an impact on unpaid work and then assess all policies for their impact on people's abilities to receive and provide care, both paid and unpaid, and on, in, on equalities properly assessed. And then you have to do something about it. So you don't only have to find out where those negative impacts are, but you have to take action to mitigate those impacts. So that's the first one. Then we had invest in social and physical infrastructure. I'm gonna say a bit more about that in a minute. I won't say it now. Transform the worlds of paid and unpaid work. So we were a bit ambitious. Um, invest in, care, in a caring social security system based on dignity and autonomy. Transform the tax system. Refocus fiscal and monetary policy on building a caring economy develop a socially and environmentally sustainable system of trade, big issue here because of Brexit at the time, work to transform the international economic and, fin and financial system. So we had some ambitions. Um, and I want to just say a little bit about after the pandemic, I can't, I'm not being able to see the top of my screen. So I need to go back. Um, so after the pandemic, what does this lead to? I want to go on to the, we've been saying that um, care policy is economic policy. So let's see what it means here. Well, everybody knows we're going to need some recovery policies, stimulus to boost demand and to replace jobs that have been lost. Um, one of the things revealed by the care sector, about the care sector in this country probably it happened in other countries, but it's particularly dire in the UK, was there's a huge amount of unmet need, um, both for, for elder care, only one in seven older people getting the care that they, one in, sorry, one in seven older people have unmet needs that nobody is providing for. Um, and only just over half of local authorities, although we have supposedly a national childcare strategy, and only oh, just over half of local authorities could parents be sure of finding the childcare they wanted? And access to care is grossly uneven in this country and for some people, potentially ruinously expensive. Um, and we also have a care system running on low pay and insecure employment. Um, I'm sure you all know about this, terrible, terrible contracts, um, very disadvantaged people, immigrants um, uh, in some parts of the country, almost completely dominated. Uh, by women from ethnic minorities and huge turnover rates. In fact, we have over 100,000 vacancies. Um, and that's a result of a sort of lack of training in care and lack of career, career progression. And of course, we have this privatized and often now increasingly financialized business model in care that completely lacks ambition to provide high quality care. Um, on top of that, we now have the effects of COVID 19, which are threatening the survival of child and social care providers and therefore of course the life chances and prospects of the women who rely on those services. Do you have five minutes? Now. Good okay that's fine so what I'm arguing is that care policy is economic policy so if we're going to look for an economic recovery let's have a care-led recovery. So the, what that would mean is investing in our social and care infrastructure to transform our broken care system. Now we call it investment because it's spending now that improves future well-being and reduces the need for future expenditure. If people are better looked after now, they won't need so much looking after in the future and, be, and more importantly, they'll feel better. Um, and it's infrastructure because it benefits not only the direct users, but the whole community. Um, and when things benefit whole communities, the direct users, you can't expect the direct users to pay for it all. Um, but these wider social benefits won't be, will need funding collectively. 
that I, this approach is a long-term approach with long-term benefits. What we mean by a caring economy is one that would have a larger proportion of its workforce employed in care at better conditions of employment than they currently are. But on top of that, investing in care also expands the labour force because there are people doing unpaid care at the moment who would then be able to uh, either increase their paid employment or, or enter it altogether. So one of the effects of a care-led recovery of, of using care to stimulate the economy is that the stimulus effects don't depend on the existing capacity. The economy, the capacity would rise to meet the demands on it. So it's a, a short-term policy that might work to stimulate the economy, but it's not one I necessarily needs to pull back on later. It's recurrent, not one-off spending. So we're not, we're, when we argue you should spend on this, on care rather than the typical construction projects, we are saying you have to do it every year, not just one-off. But that doesn't mean that it's not investment. We have a bizarre division between investment and what's considered current spending, which says that if something has to be done every year, it cannot be investment. Recurrent expenditure is never counted as investment in national accounts, um, even though it is investment because it has benefits for the future. Um, and one of the effects of that, of course, is that it is underprovided relative to the physical infrastructure that is possible, that is properly accounted for. So we did some, Jerome de Enau and I did some analysis of the employment that would be generated by spending a certain amount of money on care. In what we looked at, first of all, was how much would you need to spend to create, to have the number of people employed in care in the UK, similar to those in the numbers employed in Scandinavian countries. We took Denmark as our example. And these are the, we, what we found was that 2 million extra jobs would be created, of which the majority would go to men, but there would be still over half a million jobs going to women. And what we were doing in that was we were looking at the directly created jobs, the indirectly created jobs, the jobs that feed into the industries um, that, um, that supply the care industry, and the induced jobs. Now, these are the jobs um, that would be created by the spending of the money of those people directly employed, directly or indirectly employed in care. And so we had broke this very large number, two million um, pound, uh, two, two million jobs created that way. And then we said, well, what if we spent the same amount of money instead of on care, on the sort of things which stimulus programs usually do spend it on? on a construction project. And you, um, I'm sure you've all heard Boris Johnson going on about build, build, build as our way out of the economy. Um, so if we took the same 1.9% of GDP, I've done it in net terms because the tax return from investing in care is much higher than that of construction. Um, so I've taken account of that. You would only get just over half a million jobs in total. So as you can see, very, very much fewer for women and actually less for men too. Now, when we presented this work um, at times, people said, but you're just talking about producing some more bad jobs for women. Well, let's suppose they're not bad jobs. What happens if we had a 45% wage rise in care? And this would bring the care workers in the UK up to the same level in relation to the average wage as they are in Denmark. So again, we use Denmark as our benchmark in this. And um, we found that more jobs would be created. I mean, this would be more expensive, of course. Um, this would take 2.7% of GDP net. Um, we'd produce even more jobs. But again, if you compared it with construction, you find that you get just about the same number of jobs for men and very much larger number for women. Still, um, still really a better policy. So what we're arguing is that a care, oops. A care-led recovery would, first of all, transform care services as they then need them, be really effective way of generating good jobs, 
reduce the gender employment gap, unlike in construction, which would increase it. And therefore, by law, the government ought to, will have to do something about mitigating those effects. But it would still create lots of jobs for men. It would contribute to a healthier, better educated and more productive population and help create a greener and more caring economy. Um, actually, public support is there for that. We, the Commission also did a bit of polling, and these are some of the results that we saw. We always have to take this as a pinch of salt, but it doesn't mean that it's absolutely impossible um, to get support for that. Um, I hope, so I hope I've shown you some of the ways in which economic analysis can be turned into policy proposals in a way that might create a fairer and more equal economy. Um, we've looked at how we break the cycle of, of inequality, that we need to leave, work on all links simultaneously, but above all, that what happens to care is an economic issue. And that all policy, especially economic policy, needs evaluating through the lens of care, and that care policy is economic policy. I'm going to leave you with some links um, for the Commission itself, for the Women's Budget Group. And in particular, if any of you want to join the Women's Budget Group and get involved in this sort of turning of economics into policy, into policy work please do join us. There's the link for doing it. It's free. It's a free organisation to join and it's open to all genders. Thank you very much for the great presentation. And I already noted down some questions I have in, <laughs> for your presentations as well. But of course, I'm going to open up the floor for the Q&A now and I will refrain myself from asking them now. <laughs> but let's have a look at the questions we have so far so let me just see so i'm just gonna read out the questions which were asked so far if that's fine for you and then we can have a round of answers so the first one is to Elisa, elisa which is what policy recommendations do you ensure that we move towards the mutual corner could more flexible working forms help towards this positive development without causing the time squeeze. And I think the next question is to Sue with regards to how can this more correct measurement be mainstreamed? And let me just tag on because I have a question to this measurement as well. What would a well-being indicator look like? Because I'm very critical of GDP as well and I would just like to know. How would this uh, formulate? Another question for Sue is how do you evaluate the chances of success for your policies under the current <laughs> political environment and UK government? Okay, and the last one I think, which I would like to ask here is to everyone, I think. Most mainstream econ economists say they are sympathetic to gender sensitive theories and policies but there's an important limitation on the method or how to approach this issue. If it cannot fit a model and not be mathematized, it's not appreciated. How do all three speakers see this issue? And since there, I would like to take on and just ask if I'm allowed as a share, ask Lynn a question towards what she was presenting because I was very interested in what you presented that the jobs actually increased after the lockdown and you were asking if that's a structural change or what's going to happen and I was just wondering where are the jobs mainly created in this case and is it necessarily always lower income jobs or are there possibilities that these jobs will change in a positive way later okay so I would say the floor is yours for the questions and in case you have not noted down the question I can repeat it of course again So should I go first? Go okay. <laughs> okay, sure. So uh, the question um, about the the mutual regime. So I think that this is one of the advantage advantages of of doing theoretical models. You know, because it helps you kind of 
sort out the what is important to focus on and how these different factors uh, intersect. And so just to, to quickly respond, so that the elements on the demand side have to do with uh, the extent of caring spirit. So for instance, empirically, we measured that as achievements in health and education relative to income. So any policies that uh, use productivity growth or income growth in ways that advance achievements in health and education, and that's it, you know, a diversity of policies would be, could be thought of as strengthening caring spirits. We also looked on the demand side of production orientation. So more globally oriented economies were more likely to be inequality led. Uh, we also looked at a number of different macro policies and those that macro policies that were more oriented towards managing trade and financial openness as opposed to generating employment and well-being. And there are various ways to measure that. So that's on the demand side. On the supply side, the uh, sharing of unpaid work, the extent of sharing of unpaid work between women and men, uh, the extent of public provisioning for care, uh, the extent uh, and quality of the market care sector. So how difficult is it to find care and how good is it? Uh, the extent of gender inequality in the labor market, and also what, lastly, what we call reproductive infrastructure, which varies, right, according to the level of development, but the kinds of public investments that makes uh, provisioning care easier to do. So things like, you know, dependable access to water or uh, power, things like that. So, uh, I want to leave time for other people to talk, but I also want to address this last question too about mainstream economists uh, say they're sympathetic to gender sensitive theories and policies, but there's an important limitation on method. I mean, part of the part of this project for me is definitely a big part of it is political, and that in order to get a seat at the table to some extent, you have to uh, have a mathematical conversation with some subset of economists. And in a, a number of ways, because gender equality has gotten sort of mainstream, uh, I see this these kinds of efforts as a way to engage with mainstream economists that for many of my kind of more heterodox uh, macro um, colleagues who don't do gender, they have much less access to. So for instance, I was invited to present this model and its results at the International Monetary Fund. So I was able to talk, you know, it's a Koletskian model that has class and, you know, distribution determines uh, the amount of economic activity. So I was able to talk about class as well as gender. So it provides some interesting opportunities as well as constraints. So I'll stop there, to let others go. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Len or Sue, who wants to go next? Sue, okay. You want me to go next or? Yeah, or, yeah sure. Sorry. Okay, um, I didn't expect that. Um, well, well-being indicators. I think that this is a really interesting issue and it's a very important issue to get sorted out. There is a lot of work going on at the moment. There are also some well-being governments. There is a there is a um, association of well-being governments, um, which include New Zealand, Iceland, and Scotland. And I think possibly, I think those are the three found ones. There's an interesting characteristic that those three countries have in them, in that they're all led by women. Um, but and I think that that Wales has now joined them, which actually uh, changes the gender balance in their leaders. But and they are they are committed to the notion of running their economies with a well-being focus. It, it doesn't seem revolutionary what they're doing yet, um, and I think that they probably need 
help in getting in in taking it in a more radical direction. Um, but in terms of indicators, that the, the Human Development Index um, is an indicator that's supposed to be, in some sense, a well-being indicator. It's based on a capabilities idea, the idea that what well-being, what, what really matters to well-being is what people can be and what they can do. And I think that's a very good um, notion the, to, to base an indicator on, on a, if you like, a single idea, a sim, single philosophical idea like you know what you can do and what you can be but of course your actual measurement of it has to come, has to be in quite detailed forms um, and I'm quite I'm quite um, taken with the idea of capabilities for that and the reason for that is that if they seem a very good way of looking at care because what you really mean if somebody needs care is that they don't have the capabilities that other people have in the population that are taken for granted for other people in the population so a capabilities measure of as a well-being indicator would seem to me a good approach if you want to build um, a notion of care into your notion of the economy. I do want to say one thing about the Human Development Index, though. It, it isn't what I'm talking about because it's a way of comparing countries across each other. And what we're talking about here is an indicator to use within countries. And the broad brush approach that's taken by the Human Development Index wouldn't do for looking at things within a country. Current chances of success with this government? Um, I certainly don't think we get the whole of the program through. I, it doesn't. It doesn't follow that there aren't some um, just some possibilities of movement on particular issues, because I think I think we have a government that's all over the place. Um, and it doesn't really know when it's picking up policy. It doesn't have a coherent line on policy and um, therefore odd things might appear to it to, to be a good idea. What I'm actually much more worried about is the fact that the Labour Party doesn't seem to be anywhere with it. Um, and um, we'll just have to see. Um, I do think it's important to continue that. I just wanted to wait to say one thing about about mainstream economics and, and maths. Um, I um, I have a mathematical background myself, so I've I've never I've never been against the use of mathematics in economics. Well, I was for a period, but I think I was wrong when I was. Um, and I think that one of the one of the tools of mainstream economics that is really important is abstraction. So we don't just want a picture of the, the work. Doing economics means simplifying the world in some sense. Otherwise, we can't we, we can't understand causes and what's going on. And one of the ways of doing abstractions is mathematical. I don't think it has to be mathematical always. And sometimes trying to make it mathematical gets in the way. Um, and therefore, that sort of requirement that everything is mathematical is certainly not good for feminist economics. Uh, but the idea that we need to abstract to understand, I think, is a very important one. And, and it's, I think, shared by all social scientists, basically, in one form or another. Thank you very much, Sue. And Lynn, I just recognized that we had another question over the chat. Do you want me to read it out after you answered the first question I mentioned to you, or do you want to know it now? Just read it out so that okay. I think our time is almost okay. That's fine. Um, how could the COVID 19 emergency grant interact with the child support grant towards a better understanding of the economics of care in South Africa? Is it the case for a female basic income grant in South Africa? What so that's the, the question, additional question. Okay, I'll start with your, um, I think it was your question on, um, on, on the jobs where the jobs were uh, mainly created. I, you know, I, I was, uh, um, the point I was making is from really uh, observation from general survey data. So, you know, 
and this is specifically in South Africa, where we see, um, you know, massive job losses in trade, in transport, in communication, um, in mining and querying, in, you know, food, food and beverages, hospitality. And the losses between women and men are, are quite uh, similar. So we are actually just beginning research to try to understand why more women are getting into, I mean, partly this, uh, it, it, it seems almost obvious uh, in terms of the care deficit that has been, you know, the, the state itself, the South African government itself has started and stopped this um, relief measures you know, the, the social relief uh, uh, and, and distress grant and the temporary employ employment, uh, employer employee uh, relief grant. You know, there've been starts and stops. So I, um, my, you know, initial um, um, what at least I, I, I think we can draw from the, from the data is that it is not, because those sectors have not recovered, you know, the sectors where the jobs were lost have not recovered. And the question I did pose is where are they going? You know, and I think this is part of what Sue was talking about in terms of, uh, are we seeing um, more jobs being created in a, you know, uh, in a care economy, you know, in a kind of wage care economy? I don't know. Uh, yet, I really cannot, there's no way for me to uh, honestly answer that question based on the figures that we have. In the question of the, of the, uh, um, I'm not sure I understand very well what um, is, uh, could you, could you I mean the general question or the last question which came in? The last question which came yeah, in. Yeah, I can read it out again. So the last question was, how could the COVID-19 emergency grant interact with the child support grant towards a better understanding of the economies of, economics of care in South Africa? Is it the case for a female basic income grant in South Africa? Okay. I mean, part of the... The problem with the, with the, you know, with these grants is uh, measuring them, giving them to individuals rather than to households, right? Um, in 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 one sense, these grants don't approximate by any measure uh, the sort of the minimum consumption needs of these households, so. In a sense, uh, the kind of uh, uh, targeting uh, uh, through these grants does not seem to work. Um, the, if uh, you know, singular households uh, could, could receive grants on the basis of you know, the child support grants, the you big the universal basic income is not for women, but it's, a, it's an important, ongoing discussion in South, in South Africa right now. I'm not sure, uh, well, how keen, you know, the Namibian example has been a very good, at least Namibia has very good empirical data about the uptake and what its impact on, on, on the poverty, especially of women, um, not so much uh, in South Africa, the social relief grant that was given was was too little. So, in as a baseline itself, the existing grants do not approximate the 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 sort of um, uh, minimum consumption needs. And I feel reluctant in my own analysis to start from the basis of those grants uh, as even as a policy uh, imperative that is put to the, to the governments. I think we just, we need other measures. We need, um, 
and I think this, this ties in with the question of gender sensitive, sensitive policies and mainstream economics. Uh, I, I, I have, um, I don't, I mean, I'm not um, too enamored with, with, the, with, with uh, a sort of quantitative uh, approach. I, I think on the contrary, that we have to move from a concrete to the abstract. I think that we have to draw our social questions from the, the sort of context that, you know, in which we are existing, in, you know, what, what is the social question to which we are responding? And this has to be concrete. The populations have to be concrete because if they're not concrete, then we have the problem that we have with these grants that are talking of women. Who is women in, in South Africa? You know, how, how do we understand those groups, the diversity of the households, the questions, uh, you know, women lend themselves to, to very many kind of um, different and in, in, in intersecting problems that not, are not just around poverty, they're around violence, they're around um, uh, disability. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a roundabout way of, um, of saying that more work um, needs to be done in, ter in terms of uh, how we even um, um, uh, think of the state itself, because when you're thinking of grants, we are essentially thinking about um, uh, the state and economic policy and what kinds of data drives uh, our claims. Okay, great. Thank you so much to all three. I sincerely enjoyed the session and I know our audience has as well. And I learned a lot from the session. So thank you so much for agreeing to take part in this plenary. And I hope you're going to enjoy the rest of the afternoon for the other AHE participants. I just wanted to mention that we have a follow-up uh, parallel session at 4 p.m., a wise eye session one on inequalities from the inequalities working group and two networking sessions, one on dimensions on inequalities and explanation of economics. And these networking sessions are for people who have read or watched the material before because we basically discuss the general uh, topic. So thank you so much again for the great uh, plenary. Um, yes, and I hope you have a great weekend and can get some rest over the weekend. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you.